morning, Sabah Ahmed, Sabah Nur. I uh, just want to make one caveat. I do work for the U.S. government, but here I am on my personal capacity, and my words are my own only. Uh, please respect that. Uh, uh, I was sitting here yesterday, and, and someone said, uh, "You know, all the weapons that have been sold in, in Middle East are useless because of what the Iranians did in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia," and it reminded me. Uh, about yesterday, I don't know how many of you know, but yesterday was the uh, anniversary of the Beirut bombings, uh, where, where we and the French, we lost 241 US servicemen, 220 of them wore the same uniform I did, and 58 French. To me, uh, as an academic, and later on as a Marine, that was a watershed, still is a watershed. We had all of our forces in Beirut, on Lebanon, the French had, the French had been there before, they were the good guys as far as the Arab-Israeli was, conflict was concerned, but yet we were both targeted. Uh, while I know who did it, uh, officially nobody has still claimed responsibility, and we could not prevent it. T let's think about Beirut, and I'm not going to go much because we have a very large panel, of the changes it brought in. The use of terror to pu push policy, the use of proxies that actually worked. For them it worked. We left, we had Ronald Reagan here left, the French left, uh, and the use of Weapons that were there that were not useless with two drivers driving Mercedes trucks. And one reason they managed to do that was because we were not armed, because we came there in peace. Just keep that in mind as we think about resources and what is out there and how things have changed, the whole state, non-state. Uh, I know one of the speakers will discuss those things. Uh, we have a very, very, uh, I would, I'm actually honored and humbled to, to chair this, this, uh, this panel. Uh, I will not read all their bios for you because I want to keep time for you to, uh, to uh, have a discussion with them. And I will ask each and every one of them, and I have done that before, to please stick to uh, no more than seven minutes uh, of, of uh, intervention. Uh, I will go by the order that, uh, of the panels, and I will just introduce them very briefly to you. Uh, we will start with Ambassador uh, Lincoln Bloomfield. He is Stimson Center Chairman Emeritus and Distinguished Fellow, uh, former U.S. Department of State Secretary for Political and Military Affairs. If you want to read about, more about Ambassador Bloomfield, page 37. Those books are very nice. They have pictures, and they are for you to look into them. Uh, after that, we go to Mr. Uh, Norman Rule, former United States Intelligence Manager for Iran, you, and uh, he is also united against the nuclear Iran senior advisor. For him, he is referred to page 48. And after that, we have Mr. David Daroche, U.S. Department of Defense National uh, Defense University Near East South Asia Center for a Strategic Studies professor. And he is also a, a, a board, mem uh, board member here at the uh, National Council of U.S. Arab Relations. For David, please go to page 40. Read them, they're amazing people, and that's why you have those. Uh, after that, we go to uh, Colonel Retired Abbas Dahouk, former U.S. Department of State Bureau of Near East Affairs, Senior Military Advisor, former Embassy of the United States in Kingdom of Saudi Arabia Defense and Military Attaché, uh, Hyphen Point LLC President, that's his new position after leaving the government after a distinguished service, and also he is a board of director member of this august uh, institution. For him, please read page 28. And we have a new addition uh, all the way to the end, but definitely not the least. Uh, Ms. Uh, Jennifer Nevel, she is the Northrop Grumman Mission Systems Sector Lead for Global Strategic Partnership. I do not have her bio, and she can add a little bit more on her bio. And we have a, a commentator, uh, and Ms. Kristen Fontenrose, and uh, she, you will come in, right? She's right there, she will come in. With that, Ambassador, please, the floor is yours, sir. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks very much, Dr. Tarzi, uh, and thank you very much to Dr. Anthony for inviting me to uh, to address the group and to be part of this panel. I'm very honored. Um, you remind me uh, of what, uh, what we commemorated yesterday. I certainly remembered the Marine bombing. I was the Pentagon's country director for Lebanon when the Marines were hit. 
And I'm not sure how many people know, perhaps Norman does, that the man who trained Hezbollah in the Bekaa Valley and oversaw that bombing um, was Hassan Rouhani's first defense minister in 2013 while we were having such a collegial time negotiating uh, the nuclear agreement. But I didn't come here to talk about terrorism. I came to talk about U.S.-Arab mill-to-mill defense relations. And I thought I would start with a headline. Ladies and gentlemen, the Gulf War has ended. It's over. And by that I mean the 1991 Gulf War which set a pattern of mill-to-mill -mill relations which I believe is going to change in very important ways on our side as well as the Arab military side. So let me just give you the rough outline of why I say that. Um, the U.S. is now being guided by the national defense strategy, and if you have looked at the expert uh, reports that have been done on that, one was congressional, one at Johns Hopkins, what you see is a clear turn toward a focus on technology that will once again, increase the gap of superiority, hopefully, between the United States and peer strategic competitors, Russia and China. Uh, that means there will be an intense focus on new technologies. Uh, you will see a focus on hypersonic weapons, on autonomous and unmanned systems and robotics. You will see cyber tools integrated into, into war plans. You'll see artificial intelligence at some point, which is an indicator that we will see much more massive data used as part of, of the art of war. I, I predict that we will not see uh, large air, land, and sea combined formations surging to the forward edge of battle. Um, that, that, that dynamic is changing. We will see instead small elite groups of specialized forces um, heavily enabled by technology and data, uh, who are working closely with locals, as we've the sort of by, with, and through thesis that we have seen our combatant commanders use. And so what this means is that from a, an export control standpoint, uh, releasability will move beyond the crown jewels of, uh, of predators and night vision, and we will be focused on releasability of hypersonics and autonomous and robotics and control systems and data management systems. Um, and that's going, to be, that's going to be difficult because our own bureaucracy has to get its, its, its arms around these technologies and understand them better. But at the same time, there's another change which I think hasn't happened yet but is about to happen, and that is uh, the use of commercial communications technology by U.S. forces. Now, our expert from Northrop Grumman may have a different view of this, but I am predicting here that there will be a massive upgrade in bandwidth for both land forces and maritime forces. Today, uh, only the carriers have a lot of bandwidth. The rest of the fleet has almost none. So when you have joint strike fighters flying above, they need to be able to talk uh, to the ships below, but it's much bigger than that. Uh, the idea that we can actually connect uh, soldiers on the ground using their smartphones um, in a jammed environment with a, with a DOD cloud that connects them not only to command centers but also to three-letter intelligence <coughs> agencies in near real time is a major change. It will be a major culture change. We are not configured uh, to allow people to have near real time targeting at the forward edge across the maritime and land forces space. Now that makes sense for a lot of reasons. It means that the Pentagon doesn't have to build uh, organic programs of record internally. It means they can use the latest and greatest technology that is funded by the private sector. It also means that export controllers can more easily uh, configure these systems in an interoperable way with allies. Some of them will be more advanced and, and classified, others less so, but it, it, should, it should actually make interoperability easier from an export control standpoint. But it will change the culture of the military. What this means is that our soldiers will be individually trained to be much more data literate, to be able to, to deal with much more information at the forward edge. And so I think there are some important implications for our Arab allies as well. This will put a premium, and I'll start with my list is number one, two, and three is English language proficiency. Now I should 
be able, I should talk, I, I don't speak Arabic. And so you could, so our Arab friends could say, well, you haven't done much to try to reach out to us, and I'm guilty of that. Uh, but the fact is, in order to be interoperable, English language proficiency is, is really priority one, two, and three. Technological competence uh, at the basic soldier level is much more important in the future, and frankly, there should be technology, uh, if you will, experts embedded in military organizations. Um, this will also push decisions forward down through the lower echelons. So younger, there, you will need to breed leadership at younger levels, smaller unit, uh, autonomous uh, delegated authority. That is a culture change for many of our friends in the Arab world. Uh, there will be operations that won't necessarily be in wide open uh, de de desert spaces. They will be in urban environments or populated areas. There are a whole series of important tools which are backed by international law that have to do with protection of civilians, avoidance of hitting the wrong target, um, and, and being able to essentially defuse munitions and landmines in order to protect civilians and soldiers in a complex environment. Uh, and finally, something that the United States can always do better, but we have always had an echelon of civilians who are expert in defense policy, not just military officers. And this is something that I commend to our Arab friends as well, to have somewhere in the policy area more focus on defense policy expertise. Uh, now, having said these things, these are sort of the, the architectural changes. There is a political dimension to this, and I, I won't talk about it now, except to point out that what has also changed since the time of the Gulf War is that we don't see quite the same unity among our Arab allies as we did before. We don't see, well, we do see some individual agendas being pursued by certain states in other areas outside the Gulf, whether it's Libya or the Horn of Africa, Syria, et cetera, uh, Yemen. So this, this, this is complicated. It also uh, raises issues of support from Capitol Hill and in the administration of the future as well. Uh, there is real uncertainty, in other words, at the political level as to what the United States plans to stand for in the future and what our Arab allies plan to stand for in the future. Each side of this equation must embrace a vision of the future, hopefully a common vision, and that would help, I think, to navigate these technological and institutional changes that I see coming. So I'll be happy to hear questions and, and uh, looking forward to the other remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Please. Good morning. I would like to uh, thank Dr. Tarzi and uh, John for the opportunity to uh, following Lincoln is like fall, being playing the banjo player after Elvis. But uh, I will I will try to offer a few comments. I would also like to thank everyone for uh, attending today. This is an extraordinarily important and unique conference, and I see a number of people with very busy schedules, and uh, I know you'll get a lot out of this two-day event. Um, I'd like to uh, sort of talk about, in general, the U.S.-Arab defense cooperation dynamic, which is a, a mixed picture uh, with some challenges going forward. Uh, there is good news, and I'd like to start with that. The uh, U.S.-Arab defense cooperation also includes a diplomatic angle, which is rarely discussed. There are uh, deep strategic discussions between U.S. and uh, Arab military leaders routinely as a result of that cooperation, and that diplomacy has uh, uh, helped transform the region in, in, in good ways and prevented bad things from happening. There is also a counterterrorism element to this which rarely receives much, much um, uh, focus uh, in places as uh, far afield as uh, AFRICOM, as well as in the Middle East. And we have a routine engagement with that. But specifically, when you think traditional military uh, cooperation, there's also some very good news stories there. The uh, cooperation between the United States and the Saudi government, for example, in their missile um, uh, defense program against Yemen is uh, probably one of the greatest military successes of recent times. The Saudis have successfully, with the exception of Abqaiq and Horace, 
um, uh, prevented hundreds of uh, ballistic missiles, land attack cruise missiles, and armed drones from striking their infrastructure and country, a country which, by the way, hosts 80,000 plus Americans. So the, there are uh, and missiles, as I say, do not turn left and right over the heads of Americans. Um, we have uh, Red Sea cooperation against piracy involving NAVCENT, for example, which in involves a number of states in the Middle East, and that has made international trade more secure. And uh, senior Arab actors are aware of our efforts to bring other allies into the fold. It's routine for our military commanders, along with our senior most diplomats, to discuss our efforts to engage Europe, uh, to work with the United Nations, as part of their dynamic of explaining the issue. But, we do have some profound challenges. We have no national policy on this topic. And because we have no national policy, um, uh, we don't really have a path forward. And this is because we don't have a national policy on what is important to us in the Middle East. Congress is a um, vocal and um, um, uh, uh, authority and routinely opposes military cooperation with uh, certain countries in the Middle East to punish them or to express displeasure for certain actions. Uh, but this has consequences. If you cut off intelligence sharing and military support, say, to the Arab coalition in Yemen, we need to be very clear. This reduces their capacity to find missiles on the ground before they're launched that could threaten American men, women, and children in Saudi Arabia, as well as Saudis, as well as Europeans, as well as others. These. Um, uh, we, have no, we, we often talk about no blank check. We should not give a blank check. And that's not true. We've never had a blank check with the region. The Obama administration denied certain uh, tools to the Arab coalition. The Trump administration has done the same thing. That's what partners do in their engagement. Uh, the question, therefore, becomes what sort of Middle East do we want to have and what partnerships do we want to have? Can you give capacities to Arab partners in a changing Middle East where you do have actors in the Middle East who are now saying, if this is our neighborhood, if this is something we've got to take care of, well, we'll, we'll be in Libya, we'll be in Yemen, we'll be in these countries. And we need to do this because their definition of their strategic uh, security will be different from ours. But if we provide them with capabilities, those capabilities move into those conflicts. So I'll close with just a couple of comments. Um, the national defense strategy, as mentioned by Lincoln, is a hugely important document, and he's spot on on all of that. But where it, what's missing in the Middle East is the Middle East is engaged in a hybrid war. Uh, there are three great revisionist powers in the world, Russia, China, and Iran, but no country has so aggressively put forward gray zone military tactics in, in, the, in the region, it's near abroad than Iran. Technology is not always a good way of handling this. And uh, the problem is we don't actually have a deterrent against that activity. We provide the Gulf states with a vast amount of extraordinary ordinance, which is prevented and has shaped the con con prevented conventional conflicts and has shaped the conventional environment. But we do not yet provide any of the Arab states with what actually might deter Iran or other actors from conducting gray zone activity. And if you want to challenge that, you have to ask what deterrence have we provided that has prevented hundreds of missiles from coming against Saudi Arabia? Likewise, what deterrence have we provided that has prevented uh, the, uh, having prevented the Israelis and others from um, having to uh, do attacks in Syria to prevent Iran from working there? This also makes coordination between our militaries uh, difficult. Um, and, our, and the bad actors in the region see this and they work in the gap. I'll close with one, with one point. We often talk about how we should avoid a conventional war in the Middle East. Do we all agree that this is a good thing to do, right? Do we all agree that if a conventional war in the Middle East broke out tomorrow, we would have the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal covering on their front page, okay? You're wrong, okay? We've had hundreds of missile strikes from Yemen, Coming forward, that's a missile war with air, air defenses works superbly. We have hundreds of Israeli airstrikes into Syria, and, Isra and the Ira Israelis have lost a plane, and there's been air defense activity. That's an air war. We have cyber attacks against all members of the community. We have Iranian ground forces, not just Quds Force, Artesh, their regular forces, in three countries. 
That is a ground war. The problem in the Middle East is you have a disaggregated conventional conflict, and hence we don't have a policy against this. So if we're going to move forward on Arab defense cooperation between the United States, we need to come up with a different approach to a very changed Middle East. Thank you. Thank you very much. You have 30 seconds left. Thank you. <laughs> Well, that gauntlet's been thrown down, so I will uh, complete my remarks within five minutes and 30 seconds. Um, first off, I have to uh, echo Dr. Tarzi's remarks. I uh, am employed by the United States government and wish to continue doing so, so I must point out that I do not speak for the United States government. And then secondly, it is customary for me to recognize the delegation from the United States Military Academy, West Point, and the Virginia Military Institute, South Point. Uh, in the past, we've had uh, midshipmen from the Naval Academy in Annapolis, but even though D.C. is not a state, to cross from Maryland into D.C., you cross the state line, and that requires the concurrence of a parole officer. So, of course, uh, Annapolis is not represented today. Um, in the interest of brevity, I am going to uh, see if you can guess where I went to college. Eh? Um, in the interest of brevity, I'm going to make five quick points. Uh, so far, we've heard some really great stuff that I can, and many of you have suffered through Ramble On for 45 minutes about, um, uh, but I'm not. I'm going to have five points, and I'm going to uh, basically discuss current trends in Gulf defense thinking. Uh, the first is in the reaction of the Abk Khores attacks. Uh, the reaction we're seeing in the Gulf is not unlike the U.S. reaction to 9-11, and it's highlighted some of the things. The first is the vulnerabilities created by disjointed government. Um, just as we uh, were spurred by 9-11 to consolidate our homeland defense responsibilities from 22 separate agencies in the Department of Homeland Security, we're starting to see uh, looks at this in areas where government was set up distinctly to be fragmented in order to prevent uh, uh, coups or in order to allow different family members to have different fiefdoms. Uh, so I should point out here, people said, well, you know, why, was, uh, why were the refineries not protected? Air Defense and the Royal Saudi Air Defense Forces, which as Dr. Rule has pointed out, are an extremely competent force on a par with most NATO forces. Um, they belong to the Ministry of Defense, and the responsibility for the protection of critical infrastructure in Saudi Arabia belongs to the Ministry of the Interior. And uh, 10 years ago, I could have basically said the Ministry of Defense was the House of Sultan, and the Ministry of the Interior is the House of Nayef. Now they are coming together. Uh, so there's a structural issue there. The second thing is deterrence is a defense. Uh, Dr. Rule has mentioned deterrence. Uh, as you can tell by my accent, I'm a graduate of the University of London where I studied deterrence under Professor Lawrence Friedman. And um, uh, sometimes deterrence is a very uh, psychological construct. Uh, and honestly, the best quick reference on this is Dr. Strangelove, the movie, uh, where um, Dr. Strangelove at the end, who looks remarkably like uh, the uh, envoy to Afghanistan, Zalmay Khalilzad, um, says, why did you create this doomsday device to prevent an American nuclear attack on the Soviet Union and not tell anybody about it? It doesn't work if they don't know about it. And that points out the psychological underpinning of deterrence. Uh, and this wasn't there. Um, look, the United States relies on deterrence to protect much of its critical infrastructure. There are no surface air missiles around any nuclear reactor in the United States. There are no air defense systems around Hoover Dam. We rely on deterrence. The Saudis did that as well. And secondly, the third point, which is parallels again 9-11, it's just a failure of imagination. I don't think that anybody in the kingdom thought that there would be a cruise missile and drone attack from the north vice the south. Uh, and, you know, radar is directional. The second point that I have here is that the uh, the uh, Abkake attack pointed out that there is a lot of ignorance among people who should know better, who are paid to know about the capabilities and limitations of air defense systems, particularly the Patriot system. And uh, I appear frequently on the Arab media, and there were a lot of people who were billed as defense experts saying, well, you know, clearly this shows that everything that was sold to um, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, UAE is junk. The systems that were sold were um, sold to 
to defend against ballistic missiles, which operate at a high trajectory. Uh, drones and cruise missiles operate at a low trajectory. And so, having cited Lawrence Friedman, I must now cite another great thinker of our time, Homer Simpson, who said, oh Marge, you're wasting money vaccinating kids for diseases they never catch. Um, basically, this was a different threat, and a different threat requires different prevention. My third point, Russia is always eager to fish in troubled waters. Whenever it looks as though um, an American client is in some sort of trouble, or it looks like the United States has expressed that there are limits to its support for the client, we can count as inevitably as gravity that there will be a Russian envoy and a Russian entreaty. This should not surprise us. Um, Last week I was in the kingdom uh, at the same time as President Putin was there. He didn't even have the courtesy to send me a fruit basket. Um, I was amazed at noting that there were about eight miles of flags every 50 feet. And uh, I just don't know how they, some of these flags, you can still see the um, seams or the, the folds from where they were there. So uh, this is inevitable and we got to get used to it, which is that our security partners, they're not allies, they're partners, they have options and they will explore their options, uh, particularly if they're getting attacked. My fourth point is it is encouraging to see among our partners in the Gulf that there is a recognition now that equipment and equipment alone is not the be all end all. And as Ambassador Bloomfield has pointed out, um, Equipment is good, but it is necessary, but not sufficient. And education, starting off with English language, is actually the key to doing this. Look, if equipment could solve all of our problems, Wile E. Coyote would have eaten that roadrunner a long, long time ago. I apologize for the um, academic tone of my remarks and the obscure references. And finally, my fifth point, which is indeed education is the most important aspect of this, I'm honored that my official duties involve me in education in the United Arab Emirates, in Saudi Arabia, in Kuwait, in Oman, and in Bahrain, indeed all throughout the region, there is a major focus on professional military education and inculcating a culture of critical thinking which has been repressed both for bureaucratic, institutional, and in some cases, I dare say it, uh, cultural reasons. Um, and that is in itself encouraging. And so, as promised, five minutes and 37 seconds, I am delighted to take your questions. Six minutes and 32 seconds. Please. I'm worried I have to count. Thank you. Colonel. OK. Please. Thank you again for the introduction. And Dr. Anthony, thanks for the opportunity. I know you mentioned hyphen point. I guess I'm going to bring the discussion from a hyphenated perspective. Being an Arab American, I have a hyphen in my title, that I served 33 in the US military. So I'm going to give you a different perspective of exactly what, uh, uh, what you heard today. So first, let me take you back to uh, President Carter's doctrine back in 1980, when he said, um, any attempt by outside force to gain control of the Persian Gulf <clears throat> region will be regarded as an assault on the vital interest the United States and such an assault will be repelled by any means necessary, including military force. So here we are 19 years later, right? Many changes to this doctrine or US policies from containment, dual containment, to uh, regime change, right? To uh, democratization, and also from uh, rebalancing or pivoting forces to Asia, to burden sharing, security burden sharing, to simply uh, reimbursement of our security operations. Uh, and the reimbursement is not new. We just heard from President Trump. We've done this before with other allies. I and mean, we reimburse uh, partners like Pakistan and Jordan for their expenses and their support to our operations. So, um, but despite all that, we're still, we're still dedicating blood and treasure in the Middle East. And you heard General McKinsey yesterday when he said, uh, his troops are in contact every day in CENTCOM area of operation. So war continues. So what is our national strategy priorities? Dr. Norm was asking that question in the Middle East. What is it? Uh, also, General McKinsey yesterday, he, he, had, he uh, um, identified the national security strategy and about the national defense strategy that actually highlights our foes. And one of them was Iran. So he talks about his priorities and talks about our security cooperation. So what does security cooperation do for us? We hear about a lot of security cooperation. What does it do for us? 
He is officially security cooperation and provides ways and means to help achieve national security, U.S. national securities, and foreign policy objectives. That's what the security cooperation does. So what are our security policy objectives in the Middle East? So this is for another panel to discuss. But let's ask this question. Who is the common enemy in the Middle East to shape and focus this security cooperation in the region? Who is that enemy? So if you, one of the major topics of, uh, of discussions in the last probably two years about the Arab NATO, about the Middle East Strategic Alliance, was to identify a common enemy for this alliance. That's, the, that's the outside terrorism. Everybody agreed on countering terrorism, but didn't agree on the definition of terrorism. But again, you need to have a common enemy to, to sh shape your force. We, know, we have no doubt that Kingdom of Saudi Arabia sees Iran as the principal regional threat. Kingdom of Saudi Arabia sees that. We agree. General McKenzie yesterday agreed, that's enemy. And also the national security strategy and national defense strategy talks about enemy, uh, Iran as an enemy. But does, Iran, does Oman consider Iran as a principal threat? I mean, does Oman? Does Qatar consider Iran as a principal threat? How about Kuwait, Egypt? So uh, security cooperation in the Middle East uh, with our partners in the Middle East, we have this security cooperation towards what end? So what are we cooperating to do? What with it? We currently have a robust buying and selling of defense articles and services. There's a lot of movement in this sector, buying and, buying and selling. But not much training. We buy and sell, not much training. I'm not talking about just individual training. I'm talking about collective training where units work together constantly, go and do things together. I mean, there are some good things the council do where it brings some cadets, take them uh, to the back in the Middle East and bring Middle East here. That's, that's good. But in talking about collective unit trainings that do, do work together. And when you train, you also need an enemy to train against. You can't just go out and train and operate a vehicle. You gotta train collectively. You have to come a common doctrine to do so. So we have not identified that, that threat out there to train collectively against it. So is it Iran? Is it Iran is the threat or the enemy. So looking back, let's go back to the Carter Doctrine up to now, and let's see who did we fight. We, we have bombed Iraq, we bombed Syria, we bombed Libya, we bombed Sudan, we bombed Yemen, and we also ousted two of Iranians' mo, uh, uh, arch enemies, Saddam Hussein to the west, and the, F, the Taliban to its, to its east. But we haven't touched Iran, the principal uh, Iran. So we have a, a, I see a confused or lopsided security cooperation uh, uh, in the Middle East. And I, again, I'm seeing that on first hand as an observer, as a consumer of security cooperation, as an implementer of US security cooperation, and also policy formulator to, the, to this security cooperation in the Middle East. So let me provide a few productive comments. I learned that from Dr. Anthony, say productive comments. Productive comments on this security operation in the region. One thing we pride ourselves in the defense arena, that we work by, with, and through our partners. That we involve them in everything, by, with, and through. But I see this approach, the by, with, and through approach, as superficial, transactional, and temporary. So why is it superficial? Because the majority of Middle East population don't consider those defense articles and services we pro provide their militaries as an enabler for their security, stability, and for the defense of their territorial integrity. They don't see that. They consider that as a burden on their economy, burden on the economy, and also as a perhaps solely provided for regime protection. That's how they see it. That's why it's superficial. And why is it transactional? Because we make it clear, we're in there, we're seeking three things. We're seeking access to the region, access to ports, airports, line of communication. We're, see, we're seeking basing. We'd like to have some boots on the ground or ships docked. And we seek overflights of their airspace. That's transactional. And why is it temporary? We heard yesterday, uh, we have uh, His Excellency, I think Dr. Abdelaziz al awashik from the GCC, he, he said that the GCC since 2000, or in 2001, uh, two, uh, year 2000, 
they signed a mutual defense treaty between the GCC countries. It's signed, it's there, perhaps it's on paper, but they have a mutual defense treaty. There is no such defense treaty agreement between the United States and the Arab countries, none. So, and so if in times of war, so we may commit forces, if there's a war right now in the Middle East, we'll talk about Iran or whatever, do we commit forces to defend the region? So we may do that, we may not. It depends on the politics of the day. An example of that, we have the, the Syrian Defense Forces. Uh, we decided not to, commit, to, to do what we did. So what is the strategic, uh, uh, while, while there is a strategic utility for arms sales, it's not enough to call it security cooperation, simply arms sales. Shy of defense, serious, serious defense agreement with partner, partner nations in the Middle East, uh, security cooperation will, will not be sufficient for building necessary and, suf uh, necessary and sufficient trust for mutual defense. defense. It has to have the trust factor. So I, I, I close with this. Security cooperation is based on trust and people, and not on articles and services. Trust in intelligence sharing, and I know Dr. Noor talked about that. That's very critical. You gotta have intelligence sharing. And also on people, people in training, exchanging ideas in classrooms, training grounds, and if necessary, blood on the battlefield. Thank you. Pat Patrick Mancino, please. Hi, good morning. Thank you so much for having me. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to sponsor this important event. Uh, as Dr. Tarzi mentioned, I'm the only industry representative on the panel, so I probably bring a bit of a different perspective from some of my other panelists. When I think about defense cooperation, I think about the partnerships that we at Northrop Grumman are building with local industry and local universities uh, in this region and building opportunities for future growth with those local industry. Uh, Dr. Tarzi mentioned that I lead global strategic partnerships for Northrop Grumman mission systems. And that means that every day I get to wake up and think about what uh, partnerships we can build with local industry that will be mutually beneficial and help both companies to grow in the region. Just a few words on Northrop Grumman, if anybody's not familiar with our company. We are a $30 billion aerospace and defense company. We have about 85,000 employees worldwide. Uh, but only about 15% of our sales come from international sales. Uh, the Middle East is one of our target markets. We believe there's a lot of growth potential there, and that's why we as a company are investing so much in the region. About six years ago, we opened two corporate offices, uh, one in Saudi Arabia and one in the UAE. But we've been in the region much longer. We have a joint venture in Saudi Arabia called Vanilla Arabia, which has been there for over 30 years. And we're happy to have worked with the Saudi Arabian National Guard in training and sustainment activities. About a year and a half ago, Northrop acquired a company called Orbital ATK. And with that acquisition came another Saudi joint venture called Allied Tech Systems, uh, which builds both space and defense related equipment in the region. And I'm happy to say that we're close to establishing another partnership with SAMI, which is the Saudi Arabian Military Industries, um, which will be a company-wide partnership that will work on everything from munitions to defense electronics to training to C4I equipment. Uh, as a company, we're very aware of the importance of building um, local somewhere. jobs and localization. Uh, one of the things I personally work on is the, the utilization of our intellectual property so that we can bring new capabilities and technologies to local industry in the region. I constantly am reminding my teams that uh, it's really in our best interest to be working with local industry, local industry and be developing a local supply chain because it's really the local industry that has the customer intimacy and the awareness of uh, the customer's requirements, much more so than an outside company does trying to come into the region. We're also very focused on building university partnerships so that we're uh, building up the next generation 
of technology leaders in the region. We are adding daily new companies to our supply chain in the region, and uh, we adding lots of names to that approved supplier list. So if there's industry here in the audience today, I would love to chat with you if you can catch me on one of our networking breaks. And I'll leave it at that. Sure. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. I think this panel was the most succinct and on-point capture I've ever heard of the components that should be the focus of U.S. Arab defense cooperation over the next year and perhaps the next 20 years. So I think it's worth all of us taking notes, anyone from DSCA, anyone in policy, anyone at the commands, any J3 shops, any J5s, write all of this down, what you've heard from these folks. Because if we seek increased interoperability between the U.S. and the region, I think what we should pay attention to is the tasks the panel outlined for both U.S. and regional partners and industry. On the U.S., the way, what I, my takeaway is that the task is to address and advance the export control regulations on new technologies that will otherwise slow our ability to be interoperable. On industry, the task would be to continue the job creation and training they currently do so well and to try to speed up delivery timelines that make the competition from our adversaries less attractive to our regional partners while also using, continuing to try to use local supply chains. And on the region, several tasks that we would love to help with as the U.S. The first is because of the increasing technology advancements and the, the need for increased data and um, data and technology on the battlefield, the U.S. is going to be moving our troops in that direction. Will the regions be able to come with us? So the focus should be on education, both in English literacy and in technological literacy. And rely on U.S. partners to help you with that. Call where you need that assistance. But the takeaway is make sure your folks are up to speed so that they can truly be capable partners out there and not just sitting behind the U.S. folks. We need the by, with, and through to truly be through. Uh, we also need to address the lack of unity among Arab allies that was touched on by several partners. The expeditionary activity that's occurring outside of the region, while admirable from the, the perspective of looking at their own defense and strategic needs, is causing problems for the U.S. in terms of congressional disagreements with that activity that then hamper our ability to transfer technologies and provide training. So perhaps greater transparency on that activity would be useful. And that's kind of an easy one to fix, folks. Uh, the second would be this, the second big challenge for all of us, the task I took away from the panel, is the need to focus on deterrence as much as we are on these future technologies. So we've kind of gotten away from that. It's time to get back to that. And the third would be the need for a coordinated strategy to address gray zone and asymmetric threats. Um, that are currently shaping what we're seeing. So while we're planning for future battle with technologies, what are we doing to address what we're currently seeing? And this means more red teaming, more wargaming, more planning, more professional military education, and more co-strategizing. So I'd like to thank the panel for all of their insights um, and encourage the folks in the room to take advantage of this wisdom uh, when, when looking into what the future of defense cooperation should be in the next years or so, really with concrete plans. Thank you very much. I'll read the questions, and if you will assign the answer. Uh, keep, uh, keep, keeping to uh, methodology on the uh, qu questions, any of you are free to answer, uh, respond to any of these, or ignore them, or combine them. There are eight. Uh, how might a new intergovernmental military cooperation structure be, a, be assembled based on an Arab NATO or Islamic military alliance to fight terrorism concept? I know some of you touched on this, but if there's something missing and needs to be uh, added, please feel free to do so. How might the United States help GCC countries and overcoming limitations on the effectiveness of their military coordination and interoperability. How could the United States help in the development of a GCC-based military command? Are there particular branches or services that need enhancement more than other than others? Uh, what about literal maritime security? 
maritime security has been coming up, and Dr. Tazi knows a lot about that. How can the United States and the Arab coalition members improve their counterinsurgency capabilities? I know Dr. DeRoche knows a lot about this, particularly when compared to traditional or conventional counterterrorism strategies. How would one assess the tactical and strategic capabilities of American Arab militaries as they pertain to asymmetric warfare? Iran's capabilities in those regards versus ours and our Arab friends. How would one assess the capability of Arab states to conduct regional defense and security operations independent of United States, NATO, or other defense partners? I think this was addressed, but if you wanted to add something more to that, please feel free to do so. How can the United States assist the Arab uh, partners in, in improving cybersecurity capabilities? We know about uh, how the Stuxnet and other aspects played a role uh, with regard to Iran and also Saudi Ramco's facilities. How can the United States and Arab countries curb the illegal trafficking of small arms by extremists and insurgent groups in the region. Where are they getting their weapons from? And how are they getting them? And uh, what have we been doing, if anything, or our partners doing, if anything, to stop that, to curb that? I think uh, Mr. Rule uh, mentioned the air defense aspects of that, but uh, we're talking about small arms here. How can the United States enhance, modify, and cajole Arab states to be more transparent to their own respective counter-terrorism programs. Not sure what is meant by that. Uh, how might one evaluate the effectiveness of the U.S. in its counter-terrorism efforts in the region? Of course, the president would say, well, we've defeated the caliphate, and uh, what else do you want to know? <clears throat> how can global practitioners of countering violent extremism improve their coordination between one another? Uh, and the United States, or does it all have to be with the United States, or has it been mainly, mostly, ex overwhelmingly with the United States vis-a-vis -vis one another? And how might the United States partner with Arab countries to analyze uh, the successes and the limitations of de-radicalization programs throughout the region and apply those lessons in the future? We know that GCC Secretary General is keen on that. It's one thing to defeat the insurgents, terrorists, rebellions, revolutionaries, but uh, how do you deal with the ideological aspect, their minds, and the um, ones who've escaped from the prisons uh, in recent days, uh, and their minds, their children's minds, their spouses' minds. And lastly, um, any of you, please analyze the rift between three GCC countries and Qatar, which is the headquarters of the forward <laughs> deployed forces of America's forces in the region. Who's wagging the dog there? Uh, the countries in the region or ourselves? As one for Ambassador Bloomfield, you say there's no deterrence against Iran's gray zone activities, but question to you and any others, then what are the deterrents? And lastly, what can be done to build up the next generation of technical leaders in the area? I think Dr. Tarzi and some others have touched a little on that. Sure. Do I press this or is it working? Okay. Maybe I'll start this off because we have intelligence and military and industrial expertise to follow. So I'm going to say something a little bit unusual, which is that I want to go back to Colonel DeHook's excellent point about trust and people-to-people -people connection. That really is uh, the foundation of effective cooperation. Without trust, without people-to-people -people familiarity and cooperation, equipment and all the rest of it, structures, Political, uh, political structures have no 
effectiveness. What I'm going to say is that before we start talking about our friends in the Arab world, we need to look in the mirror and recognize that here in Washington, not only are we in a dynamic period where we don't quite know what it is that we're trying to get done from a strategic standpoint, nor do we really have uh, fundamental points of what we stand for and why it's important for us to risk blood and treasure um, to defend certain things. Is it just the defense of American lives and property, allied? No, it's not. It actually is about principle and about justice and about very much deeper values which are at risk on a major scale uh, from autocratic regimes uh, further away. Uh, how is the world going to evolve? In which direction is it going to e evolve? In a free direction or an unfree direction? So I think there's a great deal at stake. And what I wanted to suggest is that the beginning of wisdom here starts with how Washington does business. We've talked about whole of government for years. If you listen to our four stars, they can't stop saying that we need to integrate all the tools of national power. Why do they keep saying that? Because we don't do it. Right? And so I'm going to say something unusual, which is you've, you've heard uh, our, our senior military leaders talk about by, with, and through. It, very sensible, very logical. Yes, there are some limitations. It doesn't show the population the same thing as 500,000 troops in the desert. But we don't do by, with, and through at the political level, do we? We come in and say, this is what we're going to do. This is what we're not going to do. Thank you very much. Let's have a meeting. Goodbye. We don't have a whole of government structure. We don't do military for a political purpose that's measured by political milestones. It's, pretty, it's, a, big, it's a bigger subject than this. But all of these uh, questions that Dr. Anthony has repeated uh, come back to uh, the United States can begin to fuse defense and foreign policy around principles. And when we do that, we can begin to connect people to people with both foreign military, Arab military, and Arab political, and Arab cultural, and Arab civil society, we can connect around what we stand for, the future that we're leading towards. So I am an optimist. Um, my optimism comes from the wrong place, which is that we haven't done anything right yet. But once we do, a lot is possible. So I'm an eternal optimist. Uh, there's a lot that can be done here. I, I do want to say specifically on small arms light weapons, um, the late uh, President Ali Abdullah Saleh and I had some meetings. Uh, they, there was a lot of weapons being purchased, first of all, by certain individuals throughout the Middle East, and there were networks that were happy to supply them. But I would say start with the maritime force that's been in the Gulf for 72 years, beef it up, focus on it, because that's how the guns get transferred, that's where the trouble's coming from, that's how you deter Iran, that's how you get at the proxy. Uh, deniability of Iran uh, flowing arms to its proxies, uh, at least uh, in Yemen and, and the Red Sea. And I think you'll find a lot more than that, drug money and other admissions that the maritime force has undertaken. That, it, that needs to be focused on even more. Um, and so as for Iran, um, I don't think the military is the answer. I think we need to keep saying you don't address Iran militarily. They have problems internally. Norman Rule is a national expert on the subject. But frankly, there are ways uh, to make them less comfortable uh, in their own midst with 80 million unhappy Iranians. And I think that's really uh, where, where my answer comes from. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And one thing I think has been mentioned yesterday, <clears throat> based on what you said, Ambassador, there are <clears throat> task force, the combined task forces, uh, there are three of them, counter piracy, small arms, and then uh, they have been working in human trafficking. Uh, and we can learn from that. I know they're, they're very, very active on piracy. I mean, we don't have almost piracies down to zero in the Horn of Africa. These are good stories. Even China, as was mentioned yesterday, was involved in that. And, and uh, so these good stories go away because we look at, at the failures, but they actually have been very successful. Uh, and one of them has 21 countries. If I'm not wrong, I didn't I tried to find out all of them. I couldn't. Uh, and, and I have been in those exercises, and it's, it's fantastic. We could use those, but as you said, sir, it needs more, uh, and I don't want to say it, I, I come from the government, and some of them, we don't show up. You know, in the meetings, uh, every country is involved except us, we even we are part of it for various reasons, and, and yeah. that will, will encourage more cooperation. With that, 
Would you Thank you. Uh, great comments. Uh, I'd like to begin by saying I've been referred to as doctor several times, and although many people have suggested I should see a doctor, um, <laughs> I am not a doctor. Uh, I've been taught by them and examined by them, and, and, um, and they make a lot of money off of me, but that's as far as it goes. Um, just some generic comments, clumping in uh, responses to uh, Dr. Anthony's questions, uh, building on what Lincoln has wisely stated. This has got to start at home. We do not have a bipartisan approach to these issues. And a whole of government approach in the United States has certainly been tried on effect effectively on certain aspects of the Middle East for very discreet um, issues in the past. But because we lack an overall policy on the region and what success means, uh, that those experiences have not been uh, built upon. In terms of how we're doing, um, I think the CT story is one of great success. Uh, the Saudi Arabia uh, and the Gulf have undertaken significant changes to turn off funding to CT extremists. This has been underway for more than 10 years. It's often the opposite is said in public. It's not true uh, by so-called experts. Uh, uh, that transformation took place in part because of the pain they themselves were feeling from extremism uh, after 2000, 2001. But there's a success story there. De-radicalization is a long-term issue. And again, the international community needs to pull together, drawing upon the cultural and, and, and linguistic capabilities of our Arab partners to work with um, in such places as uh, uh, Syria, where you have 15,000 ISIS members uh, uh, still out there. The Gulf has put together a, a CT program among the military units. It's headquartered in um, uh, Riyadh. There is an organization called Etidal, which does counter-extremism work in the, in the region. Um, there are models which work, and I, I, know, I know the regional players involved would welcome more assistance, but I think it's less that there are uh, of, of we need to be part of this and more that they're recognizing there are no silver bullets and this is a long-term fight. Uh, as to specific things we should be doing with the GCC, uh, I think we do a superb job on conventional defense. We really do a great job. But there is a region, there is an absence, and this isn't entirely because of the fracture uh, in the GCC, of a counter cyber, a counter ballistic missile, and of course a counter drone uh, common policy. Uh, the uh, hunt for a, a MISA in Arab NATO has been ongoing since 1980, when indeed the GCC was formed. That was the purpose of the GCC. But as been stated by other speakers, you have um, different perspectives of is Iran the enemy from Oman or, or Qatar, for example. That isn't something that we can necessarily weigh in on and press. We should build those common policies. And if, if we cannot do it with a, a MISA, Arab NATO, then at least starting between what appears to be an, a, a de facto alliance, which has formed between um, uh, Bahrain, uh, the Emirates, uh, Saudi Arabia, and uh, Egypt and Jordan, um, uh, just starting there, it would be some improvement. And some improvement in that region is certainly better than, than anything else. As to the, the fracture itself in the GCC, um, I've been watching this region up close for uh, 35 years. Uh, this uh, fracture did not begin in 2014 or 15. Uh, it did not begin with Donald Trump nor Mohammed bin Salman. It could have happened, uh, trust me on this, pretty much every year since 1995. Um, I won't assign blame as to why it would be happening, but there are very different perspectives as to how the state should interact, and this simply isn't a matter of saying that one current ruler versus another current ruler don't get along or specific policies are a problem. This will require a lot of trust and investment of diplomacy um, by the United States and our military commanders in the region, but again, that won't happen unless we have a, have a, have a common policy uh, involving Congress as to what success the region is and a commitment to, to work these hard issues over time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yes, yeah, so there are 13 questions and I have 20 minutes of commentary on each of the 13 yeah. questions. Um, so, no. Uh, let me, I'm going to make three general observations, uh, four general observations, three positive, one negative, and then I'll take a whack at answering two or three of the specific questions. So the first thing is, um, one of the um, innovations the United States government has done that's been unnoticed is in the last National Defense Authorization Act, there was a Section 333 passed, which required the United States, when we sell weapons, to actually ensure that we build the institutional capacity to employ these weapons effectively. So that encompasses everything from Ministry of Defense reform. It's basically calling out the bluff that, uh, or the, 
or the uh, maybe the false pretense that's, that we've kind of been engaged in for the last 40 years since the uh, arms, 50, 60 years, since the Arms Export and Control Act was passed, 1962, I guess, um, uh, that this will help them modernize. And it, it says, okay, there has to be an educational component, there has to be a critical theory, there has to be a doctrinal component. So it requires uh, the U.S. government to engage with our partners in a way to actually ensure that there is uh, capacity. So that's a positive thing, and I spent a lot of time working on that. The second thing in terms of the United States government getting it right is I want to point to a little-known uh, organization, the um, uh, Office of uh, the, the Mission to the Saudi Ministry of the Interior. This was uh, initially established in response to the uh, uh, Al-Qaeda Abqaiq attacks in 2006. Um, it is under the lead of the State Department. It's currently headed up by Ambassador Joseph Saloum, who's one of the more dedicated dudes I've met in my life. Um, and it is multi-agency, so it's got U.S. Army, FBI, DEA, Coast Guard, uh, State Diplomatic Service, the Federal Law Enforcement Academy at Glencoe, Georgia, involved in enhancing aspects of the Saudi Ministry of, Def of the Interior. So it's a cross U.S. government engagement led by the State Department, as it should be, that uh, deals with the actual ongoing issues of internal security. And of course, it requires close management because internal security is something, uh, particularly when you're dealing with countries that aren't democracies, and we have to recognize that none of our partners in the region are democracies. Um, so, um, but it, it is encouraging we're getting it. The third uh, positive overview I want to point out is that our partners do realize the need for English. Indeed, the most requested Saudi military training course is actually English language instruction, which if you think about it, and I've served in the military for a while, we don't speak English very well in the military. So the fact that they're going to the military for English language <laughs> shows that they recognize the importance of it, and uh, it is a positive move. Now let me give you a negative test, a negative trend, which is I think because of the rise of global information, 24-hour news channels, social media, internet, you can spend all your waking hours reading news from Yemen and you can get it instantaneously, whereas in the past there might be an article in The Economist every three months or so. And what that means is that our democracy is, is expecting more of our partners. You know, I, I was uh, a child when we abandoned, abandoned the Republic of Vietnam to the communists, to what was a conventional invasion by a, by a conventionally trained armed force from the north in violation of, of uh, peace treaties. And we renounced our commitments that we'd made to the Vietnamese to replace their equipment, you know, and um, we kind of lived through that. And part of the reason why we did that was there was a constant narrative, if you go back through the archives, look at TV reports, about the corruption and the undemocratic nature and the human rights violation of the South Vietnamese government. And the American people were happy with leaving the South Vietnamese to the killing fields, in large part because of the narrative of persistent corruption and anti-democratic uh, practices among our South Vietnamese partners. Well. Now, everybody knows that Jamal Khashoggi was murdered, and that calls our presence into account. And whenever a human rights activist is, rec is arrested in Saudi Arabia or Qatar or the UAE or in any of these other countries, and I could, they all have problems, um, that calls our very basic presence there into question in ways that did not reach the average American citizen 40 years ago. And so the corollary to this is the ongoing GCC um, blockade crisis, the isolation of Qatar, call it what you will, that calls again our presence in the region into question. Why should we have our own citizens there if they can't agree amongst themselves? And unfortunately, I fear that while there is bad blood, as, as not Dr. Rule has pointed out, um, while there is bad blood there and there are internal things there, I think that the um, lobbyist community here in Washington is getting very rich off of this. This has become like lobbyist potlatch. And uh, there are people now who are vested uh, in various places around the world in keeping this alive. And, and, and we have to realize, if you take a step back, that it calls it, it weakens the American commitment, not just to the countries involved, but to the entire region. Let me quickly, specifically, uh, on counterinsurgency and asymmetrical warfare, they're more or less the same thing. Counterinsurgency and asymmetrical warfare, at the heart of it, is warfare that capitalizes on grievances in the civilian population that migrates some of the tools or aspects of conventional warfare into 
other realms like civil government, like civil populations. And so the only way to really counter it in a lasting means is to have effective government that citizens are vested in. And that is something that is not new uh, or that is, that is generally not associated in the region. We see the, the riots in Lebanon or the protests in Lebanon and the restrictions to that. Um, Vision 2030, on the face of it, and all the various reform measures in the Gulf, they are formulated in parts to undercut uh, the vulnerabilities, the, the democratic deficit, uh, the, the lack of responsiveness of government to individual citizens that provides the fertile ground for asymmetric warfare and insurgency. And so if those measures are success, successful, <clears throat> governance rather than any military or security step is the most effective counter to asymmetric warfare and a counterinsurgency. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dave. Uh, I just want to say that we have a, a few more minutes beyond the time that's stated there because we started late, so uh, okay, okay, please I'll, go ahead. I'll do a uh, couple of comments. We have about comments. 10 minutes more. Okay. The uh, ambassador mentioned the, element of, the elements of power, and we know that military is one, one of the elements of power. But we also know that the military is not working. Military power is not really doing much in the, in the Middle East. And we also know the topic of the day is security cooperation. Security cooperation is part of the military element power. But also security cooperation is a tool, it is diplomatic tools that actually see the Department of State, other agencies use that for a, for, towards a, a, an, an end. So if you have a strong military element of power of your strong, robust security cooperation, it does not, and you don't have any complementary diplomatic or economic uh, uh, strategy there, it's going to fail. A uh, big example we have at hand right now is in Syria. We have a very good, robust counter ISIS operations, good presence, very competent uh, you know, uh, 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 foreign uh, internal defense operations going in there, but did not have the uh, diplomatic clout to basically support that, that uh, element of powers. That's one comment. The second one on the counter ideology. I think there is a good case study to do this in Saudi Arabia back in 2000 and uh, I think four and five, and I think Dr. Norm was there. <laughs> he was there at that time as well. But um, this is in Saudi Arabia when they started doing their own, they have their own terrorism and happened to be not uh, a Saudi terrorist. For example, when we, President Bush declared his war on terrorism, he said, you are with us or the terrorist. So we had the, the luxury to divide that, us versus them, the terrorist. Saudis did not have the, that, that um, the luxury to do that, because the, the people are doing bad things, doing, that, doing them harm, they're actually from within. They're somebody's son, somebody's brother, somebody's dad. So how, did they, how do you tackle something like this? What's the, what they did, they did not call them terrorists. They call them al fi'adallah, means the, the deviant youth. So they brought some kind of, you know, a dignity to, not necessarily to the person that's doing bad things, to the family around this person. So instead of you know, isolating that, that guy and everybody with them. They isolated that guy as a, as, a, as a good person, but one astray from the right path. And I think that was a big thing, part of the counter ideology, and they were, they were able to actually uh, uh, control, police themselves on the inside, and, and they did a good job with it. And then, again, we, we heard that also Saudi Arabia did a great work with counterterrorism writ large outside uh, Saudi Arabia in the region and so on. Just one minor comment on the Islamic military uh, alliance that they also created. And, and that was basically called, they, it was called Islamic not because they're actually countering Islamic terrorists. I and mean, that was a strategic uh, a point from also the Muslim countries to, to get band together and said, look, yeah, we are also against this, this terrorist. We are Muslim countries. We're willing to also put blood and treasure uh, against it. Um, just back to the first comment is when I talked about, uh, uh, we talked about the increasing the military, uh, the maritime security, increasing the counterinsurgency. And my point here too, if you increase all this military capability, you don't have a complement uh, economic and diplomacy with it, that all that increase in the region is not going to get you anywhere. There's multiple examples where our maritime you know, um, uh, partners or maritime uh, uh, operations in the Gulf or in the Red Sea, where they actually captured illicit Iranian doing something, but smuggling weapons to the Houthis, and just stayed within the military or stayed within the, uh, the small circles, did not go out there because it was countering the diplomatic efforts we're doing. So even though you might have a very robust, strong military, but if you don't have that diplomatic clout or diplomatic will to, to uh, accomplish a common objective, that diplomatic, that military surge is not going to assist you much. I'll end it here. 
I'll touch on what I think was the very last question, which was about uh, building future technical leaders um, in the U.S. as well as in the region. Northrop Grumman partners with several universities um, so that we can start targeting students at a very young age who have an interest in engineering and the sciences so that we can build that pipeline of workforce and next generation technical leaders um, who can work in the defense industry. Uh, as an example, we worked with King Saud University in Saudi Arabia to build a C4 center of excellence. We've run several, um, sponsored several competitions in the region around cybersecurity and robotics and UAVs uh, to build interest in those types of, of technologies. Um, and we as a company are committed to, to continuing to invest in universities going forward to continue to build up that future workforce. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, I think uh, we had a, a, a very good panel and looking at the military aspect, I want to say something which I started, uh, I, I brought 1983 for, for many reasons, uh, but also I think one thing that is happening in the world today is we all, whether we are political scientists, government officials, uh, we look at the state model the state model, yes, it's European, but this is what's functioning. Those of us who wear uniform it represent the state. I think that is under attack. It's under attack in many ways. It's under attack within itself. Uh, you see it even in Europe. Uh, I was born in a country that split together, you know, to two countries in Europe. I was born in Czechoslovakia. But it also is happening in the Middle East, whether these states were, you know, people argue that they were formed by, by colonials and they're not legitimate, the borders are not, that's not the issue. It's, it's, look at what's happening today. You have proxies of proxies attacking countries and the reaction to them is not, uh, we don't even know how to address it. You're gonna hit, I mean, again, we still officially don't know who did Beirut. I think we know who did it and we have people here who know exactly how it happened, but nobody has still in 26 years taken responsibility for killing more Marines since Iwo Jima. Uh, and, and when you look at that, how you expect that, that creates issues with, with weapon systems, with, with government to government, because we, as a, and I say here we, I mean the international community as a whole, we don't have tools. Those tools are, the, the circumstances I think are running ahead of the realities on the ground. The theories are not even been made there, how to look at it, because all of our theories, whether and I teach IR in the, in the private, here in, in Washington, uh, we don't even have the tools for it. We can't go anywhere and say, okay, this is how we address them. And I think this is one reason that some of us are scratching our heads. Uh, you know, I'm not saying that everything is perfect. We are all, all, you know, I agree with everything that the diplomacy has to be there and, and that we have to work together. What Ambassador Bloomfield said, I'm, I'm, but at the same time, we, all of us still lack that understanding of what we are getting into. Uh, you know, look at what's happening. I mean, the way they're doing it, the messaging that are being sent, Iran is the most, at the Middle East at least, is the most capable and, mo and they're using it. A country that should be, the economy is, is in tatters. Internally, they're, they're having big problems, yet they keep on becoming the more important country because they're using these, all these tools at their disposal and the reaction to them uh, cannot be in kind and we don't know how to deter that. The Israelis have found a way, at least in Syria, but that's a specific case, maybe a learning case, but, but it, the sovereignty issues, uh, you know, we have bases in Syria, we never asked the Syrians for that. Think about these things that we formulate, whether it's education, government to government, people to people, how we look at this future, not just in the Middle East, but we work in the Middle East, of how to work these things uh, there are states, I mean, the countries have bases in states that don't exist. And I go to Djibouti a lot, you know, the French created the country in all due respect. There are 11 bases there, including the Chinese, Japan's first base since World War II. Think about these things, of how these things work together. Countries, northern Somalia, there's a country there, there are official bases on it. The country doesn't exist on the map. How do you deal with that? I think we need to, education-wise, 
think about those aspects, especially the younger people here, as you go into this government issues, that the, the book that you work through, whatever country you are, even your theoretical aspects is under attack or shifting, good or bad, it is shifting. We have to address that reality. With that, I leave you, if anybody has any. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, no, I'm gonna back up your comment uh, very quickly uh, with two points. Um, some, some are aware that in the mid-70s, I was the director of the Department of State's uh, diplomatic training program uh, for U.S. military personnel and foreign service officers posted to the Arab world. Uh, but I was also an academic and an editor and a writer at the time, so did not stay full-time as a contractor. But then here comes the Iranian Revolution. And I was called back to rewrite the entire curriculum for what had been since World War II, a country and area studies program. Nothing to do with non-state actors, nothing to do with proxies, nothing to do with cross-border phenomena. And what uh, stimulated it was the catalyst uh, for the Iranian revolution, or at least the last straw where Khomeini had been in Karbala, or Najaf rather, for 14 years up until uh, 1978, the autumn, when um, he went to Paris, came back from Paris February 1979, and broke the uh, Algiers Accord and started his revolution. As people wondered, how the hell could he do that given the presence we had with uh, Iran in the Defense Cooperation Agreement. It was pointed out that every Friday he gave a sermon, and for 14 years, and they were all taped, and they were brought back into Iran on cassettes, and they were distributed throughout the country. And here was where you had a revolution that topped a monarchy without any help from the West, or the East, or the North, or the South. It was exhilarating on one hand and frightening on the other. So fast forward to what Dr. Tarsi just said and the piracy in the Red Sea and the Indian Ocean. Uh, a friend of mine who's a friend of the um, diplomat that we're going to hear from sh uh, shortly from Oman said that uh, His Majesty Sultan Qaboos was concerned about this because Oman of all the GCC countries has the largest border on the Indian Ocean. And he said, you go to Somali and you find out why these youths are engaging in this piracy. He said, I went 18 times in one year. And I started going out to the pirates themselves and said, why the hell are you doing this? And they said, one, I have no job. Two, I cannot marry. Three, I find it embarrassing to have to live with my family for the rest of my life. Four, I have no access to affordable housing and therefore what parent is going to allow their daughter to be married to me. Five, no bank will provide me a loan because I don't have a job and a means to pay it back. This is why I do it. So then he said, I started going to the parents in an effort to kind of shame the youths into stopping this. But with the parents and the youths, he said, what are we talking about in terms of money? And the average figure was $900 a month. And Kabu said, I'll pay it. And it stopped in cooperation with the British and the French. So this sort of novel thing, as when Somalia imploded, people thought, how can a country continue to exist when it has no government. Well, it has for the kinds of reasons that he put his fingers on it. So did nearly all the others in a different way. This was 1979, the first one. Here we are in 2019, 40 years later, still grappling with these things, but unable to come up with an effective response, let alone a solution. Thank all of our panelists for being with us. Uh, thank you to all. And we are done. By the way, cassettes were little plastic things that recorded things. Some people may not know what those are.